Hi everyone. I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speaker for today. First, I wanted to say that this is the third lecture in our lecture series this semester, excuse me, our fifth. For this semester, it's the third, but the fifth total for the academic year. So again, I am thrilled to welcome Dr. David Clark. who is an outstanding researcher. I've greatly enjoyed reading his work, especially because um, you're, doing, uh, you're creating future scientists with the work that you're doing with children. I'd also like to let you all in the audience know a bit about Dr. Clark's background. He graduated from Carnegie Oh, excuse me, from MIT in 1960, and then moved on for his PhD, and I believe it was for a business degree, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Clark, at Carnegie Mellon. From there, he moved on to a number of prestigious universities including uh, going to the UK for a Fulbright, where he was, state was working as a lecturer. He also went to the University of London Business School, the University of Chicago, and then returned to Carnegie Mellon, where he worked in the Department of Psychology as a lecturer. He now has been there from 1983. He was there from 83 to 93 as chair of the psychology department. And now leads the program for interdisciplinary studies in collaboration with the business school and sciences. With that, I would like to welcome Dr. Clark to the stage. Thank you. It's been a very uh, interesting and uh, exciting and somewhat exhausting day just finding out all the stuff that you folks do here and uh, how enthusiastic you are about your work and how really very important it is. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit different than the sort of things that you're concerned about. I'm interested in how to teach children to reason about evidence. I'm going to describe some studies where the youngest children in my studies are about five years old, and the oldest children in these studies are usually in fifth grade. Um, when uh, Laura and Petito first asked me to come here. I said I didn't know uh, anything about educational neuroscience, but I knew something about education science. So maybe this is part of the lecture series on leaders in educational science. <laughs> um, and at the end of this talk, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to talk a little bit about where I think educational neuroscience fits in the larger scheme of research activities related to brain science, cognitive science, education, instruction, all those topics. So, to begin, I have five topics in this talk. First one will be about preschool children's understanding of ambiguous evidence. The second one will be um, uh, about the effects of different kinds of training, near and far transfer of experimental design skills. And I'll talk a little bit about current project where we are creating a, an intelligent adaptive tutor to teach children about how to design experiments. And then I'll finish up with a kind of overview, very brief, about where educational neuroscience fits. So to begin, um, one interesting research question is when children master this distinction between, you can call it possibility and necessity, or possible and impossible, things or knowing versus guessing, 
uh, sufficiency, insufficiency, and so on. When do they learn to make that distinction when they're looking at patterns of evidence? And secondly, can they be trained to master this distinction? An important aspect of scientific reasoning is the relationship between theory and evidence. We all know that as scientists. And it also affects the way children come to understand the, the world, how they formulate theories about the world, and how evidence impacts whether they revise their theories or stick to them or make modifications in them. When is evidence sufficient to rule out alternative hypotheses? And when is the evidence kind of equivocal? Um, when have we identified a single causal factor? And to put it in simpler terms with respect to preschool children, do these kids know the difference between knowing and guessing? So in uh, an experiment I'll describe here, we, we tell children that we're going to play a game, and the game is the knowing and guessing game, and we show them a set of boxes and we say, in each of these boxes there are several beads, on every box has beads of all the same color. Um, so in this case, each of these three boxes has a different color bead in it. Um, and sometimes two boxes contain the same color bead. Then we show the child a target object, something that we've built. They haven't seen us build it, but we tell them we built it from the, all the stuff in one of the boxes. And we say, can you be sure which box I use to build this? And we start with all the boxes closed, and then we open them one at a time. So imagine that you are five years old, and I've just showed you all the boxes, and what it is. And then I start to ask you questions. I say, I have all the boxes closed, and I show you that I've built a red necklace. And I say, is this a time you know for sure, or is this a time you'd have to guess about which box I used to make a necklace out of these red beads? And in this case, all the boxes are closed, and if you were onto this task. If you understood it, you'd say, I'd have to guess because all the boxes are closed. Now I open one of the boxes. Is this a time you know for sure? Or is this a time you'd have to guess? The right answer is you'd have to guess. You know for sure now? Or do you have to guess? You'd still have to guess. Do you know for sure now? Or would you have to guess? Well, now the child should say, I know for sure. You must have used the box uh, it has the red beads because the other boxes you couldn't have used. So now we show another pattern. Do you know for sure? Do you have to guess? Have to guess. Do you know for sure? Or would you have to guess? Uh, I'd have to guess. Do you know for sure? Or would you have to guess? I'd have to guess because you could have used either the second or the third box. So that's the nature of the game. And to summarize all the different patterns and all the explanations and the correct response, in this case, children should say they know for sure. In this case, they should say, I guess. In this case, they should say, I have to guess. In this case, they should say, I'd have to guess. And in this case, this is an interesting case we use this to really see if the children understand the task. In this case, they'd have to say, I know for sure, because if I'm playing by the rules of the game, I must have used the box I haven't opened yet. So this is an important trial to see if they really understand the game, because the right answer to this is, I know for sure. They're really telling you they know something that they haven't seen yet, so they must understand the logic of the game here. So the research question was, can children understand this kind of indeterminacy? Um, we did this with 26 children in a uh, university laboratory school. We presented with the problems just like the ones I showed you, and we asked them the question, is this a time you know for sure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what did we find? Well, five-year-old children are very good at knowing when they know nothing. They're 70 percent correct on this. No, they give the right answer most of the time. I have to guess. Um, they're pretty good at recognizing indeterminacy when it's distinctive and unambiguous. 70 percent correct on this one. They're very poor at reasoning about the potential for an apparently determinate situation to become indeterminate. Because the right answer here is I'd have to guess, because I don't know what's in that unopened box. But they only get 20% of these right. They're usually wrong on this. And the error they make is they 
they act as if they don't believe that the unopened box could ever match the box that is open. So we call this uh, positive capture strategy. It's a kind of tenacious tendency to take a single positive instance as determinant rather than indeterminate. Now, you might be surprised that five-year-olds are so bad at this, but we all know our colleagues in other fields with whose results we disagree, who do exactly this. They, they take a single positive instance that fits their theory, and they think they've really discovered something. And then we say, well, of course, there's other cases. So I think this positive capture strategy stays with us longer than we wish to know. One of the things we tried to do was then see if we could teach children how to do this task uh, at higher performance levels. Is this buggy reasoning uh, correctable? Is it instructable? Can young children be taught how to distinguish between knowing and guessing? Can they be taught to judge when a single causal factor has been identified? This is a training study that we did with uh, 28 four and five year olds. There are five phases to the study. There's a pretest, there's two training sessions, there's a post test, and then there's a follow-up seven months later. And in the training condition, we use direct instruction. We explain to the kids extremely carefully why their answer is right or wrong. Um, and we tell them just the same sorts of things I just told you. Some of the boxes haven't been opened yet. You can't be sure. You really have to wait. Um, or all the boxes are open, and now you can tell for sure. Those are the, the kind of instructions I just gave or the kinds we give the children. The control kids don't get any such instruction. They get as many problems, but we never give them any feedback. So here's an example of, uh, I've built a, uh, all the boxes happen to be open. Um, I've built a yellow necklace, and if I ask a child, if could they tell for sure, the right answer is yes, I could tell for sure. Um, we used several kinds of materials. The first one was uh, beads. This one is magic markers, which Magic, which color magic marker did I use? And instead of boxes, we take the covers off the magic markers. And as so we, we have many different contexts to do this in. The design of the study is on the first day, we do a pretest, and both the training and the control group, they don't get any feedback. Then in the training phase, there's two days of training. Um, we change the materials. We don't want what they learn to be material specific. We're really after the underlying logic here. So we change materials on days two and three. And here's where the experimental contrast comes in in my study. Um, half the kids get explicit feedback of the kind I just told you. The other half get no explicit feedback. Um, then the next day, we give them an another kind of material. Um, we assess them to see what they learn during the learning phases. There's no feedback. And then seven months later, we come back and we give them the same task again with uh, another set of materials. <coughs> okay, this, the uh, graph I'm gonna show you shows the proportion of children who become what we call experts. They get at least 15 out of the 20 problems correct. And what you see here is a striking difference between the five-year-olds in the training condition and the red line that's right on the uh, zero axis all the way across the uh, four-year-olds in the control condition. Let me explain this a little more carefully. The five-year-olds have given repeated and explicit instruction. They learn quickly. They remember what they've learned, and they remember it seven months later. The five-year-olds given no instruction, discovery condition, do learn. It takes them a long time, but they do eventually get it. They figure this task out kind of on their own without any instruction, but it takes them a long time to get there. Four-year-olds give an instruction, explicit instruction, do learn. They do learn very quickly, but they don't retain it seven months later. And the uninstructed four-year-olds, as you can see, they, they never get off the, uh, the action. They fail to learn. We have no experts in the uh, uninstructed four-year-old group. So what are the implications here for STEM education? Um, excuse me. <coughs> I'll let you read this while I take a drink. Okay, later on I'm gonna to try to classify this type of study in, in a little mix that I'll explain to you. But this is a kind of study that is sort of within the profession. 
We study kids, we put it in a journal, it's kind of interesting. It doesn't have really clear instructional implication or educational implications. It's typical of a large proportion of the kind of papers that get published if you're interested in cognitive development. It just shows you something about the way kids think and the way certain things can be trained. Okay, now let me shift to a second topic where I'll spend a lot of time. This is on the effects of different kinds of training on near and far transfer, in this case, transfer of experimental design skills. The goal of our studies in experimental design is to determine the relative effectiveness of different ways to teach a very important topic in science, design experiments. Um, and that's called the Controllable Strategy for Historical Reasons, and it's CVS for Historical Reasons, and with CVS long before there was a drugstore called CVS, so they kind of scooped us. Um, but we're studying CVS, Controllable Strategy. We're not teaching domain knowledge, we're not teaching physics or friction or um, electricity, or, we're not really interested in these studies about teaching anything substantive, although we have to use a substantive, a real domain, in order to do the experiments. But our goal is to teach something much more general and abstract, that is how to design an unconfounded, simple experiment. That will reveal a factor in any domain. And the main experimental variable in our work is the type of instruction. So we try to teach this using different types of instruction. This CVS is important because it has both procedural and conceptual aspects. The procedure um, is important. You have to know how to do this in order to design an unconfounded experiment. And the underlying concept is fundamental to science. You've identified a causal path. So there are these two procedural and two components, procedural and conceptual. Thematic reasons for studying this, um, the thing to be taught, experimental design, it's a core topic in all early science instruction. Uh, it's included in all the national and state assessments in the United States. It's included in the TIMS and PISA, the big international comparisons. If you get the released items from any of those tests, you always find a couple of experiments on simple experimental design. So it really is viewed as a core important, essential component of what, what's to be taught and what's to be learned in science. This in terms of few uh, productions or few simple knowledge components using kind of Carnegie Mellon lingo here, um, the rules for CVS, I'll list them here, and you don't have to read them carefully. It just turns out that you could list abstractly what the rules are for designing a simple unconfounded experiment. That's what we teach our grad students all the time. You know, you have a contrast, you have one thing set to one value, one thing set to the other. If you're lucky, you've controlled all the other variables, you run the experiment, you get an effect. Um, one thing was greater than another, and therefore you have isolated the causal variable. But you can't teach this to fourth and fifth grade children in this abstract form. So you have to teach it in a real, in a meaningful context. We need some simple physical con uh, context in order to teach this, and we've used several. Um, here's one kind of context, we, the springs. Uh, children are asked to design experiments that cause springs to stretch, and they're supposed to compare two springs. They take two springs, they hang them on the spring rack, um, they take a few weights, they hang the weights on the spring rack, and they see whether or not any of these factors that vary here are causal with respect to elongation. So these springs differ in their length, in their width, in the thickness of the wire in the spring, and in the size of the weight that you hang on the spring. If we ask a child to design a good experiment, and we use that terminology, can you design a good experiment to find out whether the length of the spring matters and how far a spring stretches? And if a child did this, we would say, that's a good experiment. Why is it a good experiment? Because it's unconfounded. The only thing that varies here is the length of the spring. Everything else is the same. If one spring stretches further than the other, it's got to be because one spring is longer. Everything else is the same. So this is an example for a member of fourth or fifth grade student. This is an example of a good experiment. Here's another domain that we use, and here's a very bad experiment. Sometimes we even use the phrase, this is a dumb experiment, or this is a silly experiment. 
It's certainly not a good experiment because it's completely confounded. If the child wanted to find out whether or not the surface of the ramp made a difference in how far the ball rolled, this is not going to do it because everything else varies. One ramp is high, one ramp is low, you have a golf ball on one, a rubber ball on the other, and so on. So you, ha you haven't identified the causal factor. Here's what our ramps actually look like. This is a picture of a good experiment. Um, this ramp is a, a low ramp. This ramp is a high ramp. They're both starting at the high part, the uh, long, they're gonna have a long run, a long run. Um, the same kind of ball in both cases. So this is an unconfounded experiment for ramp steepness. <coughs> there are theoretical reasons for investigating CVS instruction and the, the theoretical question that we face is, what's the best way to teach it? We have this spectrum of uh, teaching approaches in science and, and really in us about every subject and it's quite a contentious um, research area, the extent to which we want to use an open-ended discovery approach to teaching and the extent to which we want to use an extremely explicit direct instruction method. Unfortunately, in the area of science education, there's a proliferation of terminology and little agreement on what the terminology even means, even though people believe in one approach versus another with great passion. So we have about constructivist approaches, explicit instruction, adaptive instruction, authentic instruction. People in education research love that term, authentic. Because how can you disagree with something that's authentic? So authentic is big, whatever it means. Um, Student-controlled learning, brain-based teaching, hands-on learning, holistic education. These terms are important, but they're not very useful unless they're operationally defined. Now, it's very important to define what you mean by them. In my own work, I really define very carefully what I mean by a certain kind of instruction. And it, the label that I use doesn't matter as much as the actual content of that particular instructional approach. <clears throat> There's a lot of um, beliefs about methods for teaching science. Um, discovery learning is superior to direct instruction. Discovery learning leads to deep and lasting understanding of phenomena. Children who acquire knowledge on their own are more likely to apply that knowledge than students who have been presented with knowledge. Is that true or false? Is that true or false? Is that true or false? So I thought it'd be nice to find out if these things are really true or false in the focused domain of learning about experimental design. I don't think there's a general answer to these questions, by the way. I think the answer depends on what's being taught and probably a lot about what the learner already knows. So um, we did a study, uh, Zi Chen and I did a study uh, several years ago on looking at these questions, different ways to teach CVS. So we c contrasted three different methods. We called them direct, Socratic, and discovery. We taught them to three different grades of students, second, third, and fourth graders. And we had several phases to the study. There's a pretest phase, an instructional phase, post-test, transfer, and then transfer, more transfer. Each method, each type of instruction can be viewed as a, a vector, really. Each instructional method has a set of attributes, and that whole set of attributes is what we mean by the method. So for direct instruction, we mean the goal setting is done by the teacher, um, students are manipulating the materials, the teacher's designing the experiment, the teacher asks the probe questions, is this a good experiment or is it not a good experiment? The teacher gives an explanation, this is actually kind of a dumb experiment, this is a great experiment. This is a smart experiment. This is not a smart experiment. Then we summarize why that particular experiment is good or bad. Um, we don't ever execute the, the experiment in the direct instruction. We just go on to the next setup. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that. Um, so we have these three kinds of instruction. Uh, they have all these features to them and they vary by each column. The direct instruction I've already described Socratic instruction uh, has some similarities to direct, but it has some important differences. The students designing the instruction, there are probe questions because the Socratic method is supposed to have 
probe questions in it, but there are no explanations and there's no summary. Children actually execute, they actually run the experiment and the discovery condition has even less structure to it. Um, there aren't even any probe questions. A student sets up an experiment, runs it, and then they just set up the next experiment and they run that and the instructor doesn't tell them anything. It's very open-ended. So what would be fine? Well, um, the training variation occurred where the blue line is here, and these, this graph shows the three kinds of instruction, and then within each type of instruction it shows how the different grades did. As you can see, direct instruction, children in all three grades show immediately, immediate gains. Even the second grade children wind up after instruction doing as well as the fourth grade children when they started uh, pretest. Socratic, there's no immediate gains. And discovery, there's no immediate gains. So, and the immediate, short term, it looks like discovery learning really is quite effective. Direct, I'm sorry, direct instruction is really quite, quite effective. Well, maybe direct instruction is better for learning how to design good experiments with one set of materials. But what happens if we transfer the child to a new set of materials? If we just showed them about ramps and then we show them springs, are they going to understand that they really have to do the same thing in a very abstract sense with the springs as they did with the ramps? <coughs> um, and if this is true, if this critique is true, then we should see a drop off when we change the materials that we give the children. So, a few days after initial training, children are asked to design experiments with novel materials. See, whatever they started with, now they get some new material. So everyone um, in, the immediate, in the medium transfer is now trying to design experiments in a domain in which they were not taught how to design experiments. The underlying logic should be the same, but the materials are different. And that's what these results show for T1 and T2, where if they started with springs, here they have ramps. If they started with ramps, here they have sinking objects, dropping things into the water. Direct instruction, children in all three grades show significant gains and they maintain it on transfer. Socratic, no immediate grains. The fourth graders do slowly start to pick it up, just as we saw in the earlier study on uh, evidence evaluation. The discovery children, um, no immediate gains, some improvement, but very poor performance for second and third graders. Okay, um, here's another critique on direct versus discovery learning debate. Maybe direct instruction is okay for learning and maybe coming back the next day, but you're not going to retain this stuff for very long. It's going to just fade away. It's a reasonable critique. So then we decided to do an assessment several months later to see if, in fact, children could still perform at very high levels or not. <clears throat> Here the assessment was a totally different form. And this has all the properties of, you know, when you talk about transfer, there's many components to transfer. And what makes one situation a transfer test from another is uh, the context, the length of time, the, the experimenter who's presenting the materials, the kind of response that's required. All of that is different, although the underlying notion of an unconfounded experiment, the abstract notion remains the same. So we show children a 15-page booklet. It has all these binary comparisons, and we we'd simply have to circle, given the goal. In this case, does the amount of water affect plant growth? Is this a good test or a bad test to find out whether the amount of water affects plant growth. We read it to them so there's not a reading issue. Then just circle good or bad. And then we, we score what they did on this 15 item assessment. And this, as I said, this is far transfer because everything's different from where they were trained. What we found was seven months later, um, these scores show the proportion of students who we classified as good reasoners. And we got 13 more out of the 15 questions correct. And both grades who were trained on direct instruction did very well on this task, and the children who didn't get direct instruction um, did pretty poorly. <clears throat> okay, so direct instruction is effective, more effective than discovery and learning about a simple experimental design. The results remain after seven months. 
and performance is far from um, this is actually an interesting issue and in, in when you're putting uh, research in this area into journals that are oriented primarily toward cognitive development cognitive psychology, you know what matters here is is your p-value but when you're dealing with educational issues really effect size is really important are these kids you know one or two grades ahead of the kids who weren't trained so there's a slightly different um, emphasis and even in these studies not everybody learns from direct instruction it's not it's not a hundred percent full so another critique of the kind of work that we got was well first of all even with your little booklet and your 15 page item and all the rest of it it's really too simple it doesn't capture authentic scientific reasoning and the kids who are being taught by a direct instruction they're missing something they're missing something that's important um, and the discovery children might have gained that maybe they just have a something with deeper insight or they're better reasoners so this is the kind of criticism we got and we decided we would create a more authentic assessment we asked children to judge science fair posters that other children had made this is certainly a far transfer test you ask a fifth grade child to look at a science fair poster that another kid has created and to give you comments about whether they see whether it's a good experiment or not. So this question is whether children who have learned something by discovery be more likely to transfer that to new and challenging contexts than children who have learned via direct instruction. So directly addressing the critique that direct instruction is sort of it may work in the short run, but it's really kind of brittle, and the kids who have learned via discovery are somehow, they've, they've bootstrapped themselves, and they really have a deeper and richer understanding of the topic they're trying to teach. Simple critique, we wanted to address it directly. So we did this thing we call the Science Fair Study um, with uh, 100 students, third and fourth graders. We trained them on either of the two extreme methods. Half the kids were trained on CVS, and direct instruction. The other half were trained using the discovery condition. And then we looked at how well they learned CVS. And then a week later, we bring the children in uh, with an experimenter who's blind to condition. And we have them evaluate science fair posters. And we see how well they do on the science fair posters. So let's take a look at this. Um, the design here is on, there's a pretest, There's the training manipulation where half the kids get direct versus discovery. Then there's a post-test. Then a week later, we do the science fair study. So let's look at the day one results first. <clears throat> first of all, this shows out of four experiments, the proportion, of the number of experiments that children created unconfounded designs. Um, and the, uh, as you can see, the direct instruction children, many more of them increased. Uh, the discovery children, some of them increased, but then only the average score there was about one and a half. Another way to look at the same result from the first part of the study is we classified a child as an expert if they got at least out of four. So these two, this chart shows the proportion of children who are classified as experts, expert CVS students, expert experimental designers, if you will. When you can see, 75 percent, a little more than 75 percent of the children in the direct instruction condition turn out to be experts. They didn't all become experts. 25% of the kids in the discovery learning condition became experts. It's not the case that nobody learns from discovery learning. We're not making that claim. Just a much lower proportion of kids. So what happens a week later when we give all those children the science fair posters? Um, here's what the posters look like. Uh, here's a typical science fair poster. Um, if you, any of you have ever judged science fairs, you'll, you'll see this. I was talking to you all earlier at lunch about this. So this is a typical poster. This poster is made by a young woman, as you might guess, because of the items on the list, on the memory list. She wants to know whether boys or girls have better memories. And she describes her procedure, uh, what they do. She describes her results, and she concludes, girls do have better memory than boys. So that's her poster. Another poster, this is a poster from a little boy. You know, it's, it's, a guy, it's guy stuff. It's ping pong balls, and he's shooting ping pong balls across the living room floor, and he's putting different holes in them, and he's measuring how far they go. He thinks the more holes there are, 
the shorter distance it will go, here's his procedure, here's his materials, um, here's his results. This is an interesting result. Um, this is a really interesting result because the child notices an anomaly in his data. And that's when a, when a kid does that in a science fair and actually reports it, you really have a budding scientist. He's, he's surprised by the result, but the data are the data, and he's reporting them honestly, even though his theory is not quite right. And he says, this was surprising to me. Okay, what do we do with that? We show all these posters to our kids and we interview them. We have this very complicated structured interview. The sooner they say something interesting, the more points they get in that category. We don't ask them these particular questions, but we find out what they know about the poster, all of its aspects, and then we just sum all their comments and we basically get an assessment. Their poster is an assessment of their ability to look at a piece of experimental science and make a judgment of how good it is. So the poster score is this far transfer measure and I think a meaningful transfer measure of what kids have learned about experimental design. Um, so the question is whether the few children who master CVS in the discovery condition do better in poster evaluation than the many who master it in the direct instruction condition. And this is the kind of uh, prediction that people who are really opposed to direct instruction would make. They would say, these kids, when they got it on their own, they're going to be better off down the road. But we didn't find that. Um, so we have five categories of students. Um, some of them were experts from the outset. The training couldn't help them any because they already were 100%. We have students who became masters under direct instruction. There were 40 of them out of the 52 students. There were students who became masters in the discovery condition. There were only 12 of them, as I showed you earlier. And then there were students who didn't get it, even though they were in direct instruction, and students who didn't get it even in discovery. And if we look at the poster evaluation scores of all the kids who became masters, it doesn't matter how they became masters. And if we look at the poster evaluation scores of the children who did not become masters, they do equally poorly. So the conclusion is <coughs> CVS mastery is strongly associated with high poster scores. The path to that mastery is irrelevant. <coughs> path to non-mastery is also irrelevant. So, come back to the initial question. Are children who learned it by discovery better? No. The many who learned it in direct instruction did just as well as the few who learned it by discovery. This result in this domain shows it doesn't matter how you learn something. What matters is that you learned it. And I'll ask you to just ruminate, think back on your own history, think about some thing, some skill you have, some PowerPoint skill you have, or some tricky way you have of using the, the web. And you probably don't remember whether somebody told it to you, or you looked it up in the manual, or you figured it out yourself. What matters is that you know it. It doesn't matter whether you read it. You know, Some people open up the manual and they get a new app. Other people never look at the app. People have different styles, but what matters is that you mastered it not the way you were taught. <coughs> um, let's see, how am I do, I'm going to cut something. I'm going to go a little bit fast here, but I will describe this study very quickly. Dan Schwartz School of Education at Stanford has a very interesting line of work where he has something he calls preparation for future learning, in which some very nice evidence that instead of teaching people right away how to do something, you let them struggle for a while. And after they've struggled for a while, then you come in with a fairly explicit direct instruction. And he's shown that the people who struggle in the beginning do very well, and they maybe do better than people who didn't have the struggle. Imagine you're trying to teach students about um, means and standard deviations and how to compute them. Um, and you first give them a very open-ended task where they have to look at a distribution and say which one of them is more clustered or more accurate. And they're supposed to come up with a numerical formula. And they're trying to invent a formula for computing a standard deviation or a mean. But they can't quite come to grips with it. 
and they're struggling, and then you give them the standard lecture, he's found that those students do better than students who didn't have to struggle. So we thought we would apply that to our domain um, and see if it worked, to see if preparation for future learning affected the acquisition of CES skills. And we had these two conditions. There, I won't go too much into the detail, but you'll get this. the high guidance condition is very much like direct instruction. Um, we design experiments. We ask the probe questions. We explain why they're good or bad, and then we summarize the logic. The low guidance students were asked the same question, but they didn't get any instruction from us at all. So high guidance and low guidance in this study are very much like direct versus discovery. And then we decided to do them in two sequences. High, 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 low, low, high, or low, low. You get like two doses. <coughs> because it's believed, and his research shows, that low guidance followed by high guidance is very effective. So we wanted to test that. We wanted to test it in a more systematic, a balanced study. So first there are some story problems that the kids have to answer. Story problems are little things that look like this. They're paper and pencil tests about simple unconfounded experiments. They have to decide whether or not this is a good way or a bad way to find out whether or not the number of windows matters on a rocket ship. And the right answer here is this is a good way because everything else is, is controlled. So that's on the pretest. That those kind of items are also on an eight-week post-test, um, and they're also on a 24-week later post-test. These are the conditions. The high-high condition got a lot of instruction in both phases. The high-low is high followed by low, and so on. <clears throat> what do we find? Both of the, whoops. All groups, all four groups start out roughly equivalent, so we have the randomization work. Um, the groups, the two groups who start out with high instruction immediately get almost to ceiling. The two groups with low instruction go up a little bit, but not very much. Um, now we have the low high group, those are the green ones. They started low, but then they got the high training after. And as soon as they got some high training, they did very well. The high low group starts to do poorly on, this, on the transfer tasks, and just to follow this all the way to the end. Um, the, uh, after 20, if you got high training anywhere along the line, you're doing very well. It doesn't matter when you got it. It just matters that you got it. A low, low training, they do come way up where they were um, back in week one, but this is 24 weeks later with lots and lots of testing. So there is some discovery learning going on here for sure. Never said that it's zero. It's just extremely inefficient. Okay, hi, hi, I just said that. <clears throat> and there are arguments, uh, Sweller et al. wrote a recent paper about uh, lots of different approaches to instruction, and they view the, the primary constraint is what the cognitive load is of what you're putting on the students. And if they're in a discovery condition, the cognitive load is often very high. There's lots of extraneous things they may be paying attention to. When you're in the direct instruction condition, the cognitive load is controlled by the teacher, and all the relevant stuff is simply not mentioned. Okay, direct instructions effective individually, authentic context, better sooner than later, long-lasting retention, works well with high SES students. What about struggling students? What about students with lower reading levels and greater attention problems? So far, I've been describing studies done primarily in middle-class schools in the Pittsburgh area. Um, we've also done some research in some of the more challenging urban classrooms around Pittsburgh. In this particular study, we have kids 90% eligible for free lunch, you know, quote, poor kids. Um, and we used a very different technique. We went in and used a very open technique. The teacher is also one of our research staff. He's going around the classroom working with dyads of children. Um, he's doing a lot of ad hoc diagnosis, discussing things with them, really doing a wonderful adaptive instruction, trying to figure out exactly what their misconceptions are. And for these two kids dealing with that issue and then going on to these two kids and dealing with a different issue, kind of doing a formative assessment some of the, from the language of educational research. And what we found was that we started out with these uh, 
inner city kids, they're doing terribly. I mean, 10% of them or, or less can design an unconfounded experiment with ramps. But as we walk around the room and you know stop at each group and try again and try again, we see a, a increase over a two-day period until the children <coughs> I'll let this graph speak for itself again. Even when we swap, here we swap domains. These children are doing experiments with ramps. These children are doing experiments with pendulums. What determines the period of a pendulum? The length, the plumb bob, and all the rest of it. <coughs> again, they drop off right away because they don't realize that what they've learned is domain general but then they quickly get it. So this experience um, made us look very carefully at the kinds of comments that these low SES children were making. We realized that we missed a lot of issues in our earlier studies. Um, they were there when we go back and look at them. But first of all, there are many more misconceptions about CVS. For example, some children misinterpret the purpose of a fair test. They'll set up two ramps that are identical. Same height, same ball, same surface, same length. Why'd you do that? You told me to make it fair. Fair means fair. Fair means, that's a fair test, isn't it? If everything is the same. So here's a terminology that we've been using and we didn't realize could be totally misconstrued. <clears throat> here's another one. They'll set up one ramp. They kind of have a predictions about what's going to matter. So they set up a high ramp on a smooth surface um, with a, a very heavy, massive ball. And they set up a low surface. And we say, well, why did you do that? And they say, we want the ball to go the furthest. They're not interested in isolating causal factors. They just want something exciting to happen. They want to blow up the classroom. They want, they want a lot of action. We call them the engineers. They want to get a big result. Some children would design a confound in which the uh, color of the ball was different. In some cases, we use identical balls that were just different colors. They would set up an experiment, and one ball is blue and one ball is red. We'd say, why did you do that? They'd say, well, the color of the ball can. We'd say, yeah, but you don't know that. They'd say, yeah, we do. It's, it's stupid. I mean, the color of a ball can't matter, so why can't we have a red one here and a blue one here? So they don't want to adopt the hypothetical stance that we think is so important. Huge individual difference um, here that we need to adapt to in our instruction. We need to diagnose these individual differences and adapt the instruction to them. Um, I'll skip that slide. So the next phase of the work was to construct a, a computer program to try to teach this. And since I'm at Carnegie Mellon, the home of the intelligent tutor, we have for the past couple of years been actually constructing a tutor that will adapt individually to different students' knowledge and misconceptions about um, how to construct an unconfounded experiment. And that's the third topic here. Um, remember, these are the rules we're trying to teach, but remember also we can't teach these rules as they exist here. We have to contextualize what we're doing. So we wrote this computer program to try to diagnose the extent to which children have mastered each of these rules, and then we adapt instruction to their level. There's this tutor that you can get off the web and play around with it if you want to. I'm not going to do it live here. Um, this is a typical screen uh, where children are asked to design something. The interface, um, it's kind of a cool interface. If they, if they want to work in the diagram itself and slide the, the ball around or change its color, they can do that. And the words will show up in the table. If they prefer to work with text, if they type the word in the text, then the animation corresponds to the text. So they can use either uh, kind of a visual or a text-based representation, depending on what they're comfortable with. Um, then when they do something, we ask them uh, why they did it, and then they go to this drop-down menu, and they choose one of these. And each of these answers gives us some insight into how well they understand what they're doing, or whether they just guessed. Um, child might check that off. Um, the tutor is very complicated, looks like that. Um, there are all these branching. If you ever try to build an intelligent tutor, it gets really kind of hairy. There's all kinds of branches and, and paths you can go down. But we're trying to track what these students know about CVS. 
um, and I'll skip that. The tutor is on the web. We actually did, uh, our, one of our very early studies of the tutor was to work with a non-adaptive version. We wanted to make sure that even without the adaptation, will students just sit still for a lesson in how to design experiments when it's being taught entirely by a computer. So we had kind of a horse race between their teacher, their science teacher, who taught this material using you know, uh, PowerPoint, uh, controlling the whole class, and the tutor itself, where the students sat at these individual uh, uh, workstations, and it taught them how to, how to do CVS. It didn't even adapt to them. And what we found was that even the non-adaptive instruction versus a human um, was, a, it was a fair test. They, they did just as well with Ted as with the uh, human tutor. These differences here are um, slightly significant in favor of the human, but there were some other biases in the study. <laughs> okay, so that's what I want to talk about. My research, I'm just about done. I do want to address this larger issue that I said I would address. Um, but where does educational neuroscience fit in the educational sciences? So here I'm going to shift gears completely and try to give you a kind of intellectual overview of the field that we are all struggling in. And I want to talk about this book called Pasteur's Quadrant, which some of you may have read. Um, book by Donald Stokes came out in uh, 1997. Stokes was an eminent uh, political scientist, social scientist, actually died in a year of when this book came out. And he said he wanted to re the relation between basic and applied science. That was his goal. This book, last time I looked, has over 2,000 citations, which is astounding for a book. Um, people like to cite this because it's quite, quite an impressive and important book. Um, here's what Stokes said. He said, if you have a traditional view about the relationship between basic research and applied research, um, you get something like this. There's this idea that you start with basic research, then you get some more applied research, then you might get some development, and eventually, technology and application comes out of the whole thing. And the example he gives is people working in condensed matter physics were doing very basic research. And today, you know, you have your iPhone and you have uh, circuits and all that kind of stuff. Stokes felt that this view, this basic to applied view of the way the scientific and engineering endeavor goes, said, put it in kind of cumbersome language, the belief that the goals of understanding and use are inherently in conflict and that the categories of basic and applied research are necessarily separate is itself in tension of science. That's a kind of cumbersome way to say that this view is just wrong. It's not the way things really happen. Um, and so if this is wrong, then what's right? What is the way to look at it? And this is where the famous two-by-two two matrix that he called Pasteur's Quadrant came from. He said, let's consider two things. First of all, is the research inspired by considerations of use? Still kind of cumbersome language. In other words, is the research applied in any way at all? Is it useful? And the other, and it could be no or yes. Another question, is the research inspired by a quest for understanding? And the answer to that could be no or yes. And then he took some iconic scientists from the history of science. Unfortunately, he only chose males. This is probably old-fashioned. You can't get away with this anymore. You have to include some female scientists, and for good reason. But he, he only chose male scientists. And over here, he put Niels Bohr, who wants to do research on the structure of matter. Had no interest in applications of it. Down here, he puts Thomas Edison. He just wants the light bulb to stay lit and not blow up, okay? Um, no particular interest in quest for understanding, but a big interest in use. And up here, in the place of pride, he puts Pasteur. Why does he put Pasteur there? Well, what did Pasteur do? Not much. He verified germ theory and invented microbiology and invented pasteurization and vaccination and told people so they deliver babies and uh, discovered fermentation and cured silkworm disease. Okay, very, very basic science. And also, clearly, 
inspired by considerations of use. So that's past. And ever since I read this book and then started to get involved with uh, IES and the initiative and education research and NSF and the NSF centers, um, I'm sorry, one more slide. One thing that Pesher showed very importantly, that there's this flow. People tend not to an area. You may start off doing basic, you might find something that takes you right over to an applied technology. Or you might be in technology, trying to do a piece of engineering, and you realize you have to start doing some basic research in order to advance your engineering applications. So this temporal flow, this diagram is actually in the Stokes book, but nobody ever reprints it. It's just about four pages after the famous uh, quadrant. He has this diagram, which I think is very interesting, and it sort of explains, in my mind, a lot of what's gone on in the SL, the various science and learning centers. Some of them are, you know, they start out with existing understanding, and some of them have moved toward technological applications, and others have started out with some technology and moved the other way. <coughs> I put my own, I mean, I'm not, my studies have <laughs> none of the grandeur of Bohr or, or Edison or Pasteur, but when I look at my own studies, I think the study on knowing and guessing really belongs up here. It's a kind of, as I said earlier, it's a kind of academic exercise. It's sort of interesting. You could make a, an argument for maybe you could apply it. Maybe you shouldn't try to teach kids in fourth grade or younger about evidence evaluation, but that's, I think the study belongs up here. I think the CVS stuff has both applied and basic implications. And building the adaptive tutor is very much an engineering effort rather than uh, a scientific effort. So I think that's uh, the, real in, the real interest there is use. <coughs> and the funding agencies, I think, also fit this. I think the Science and Learning Centers and the whole NSF initiative belongs up here in the top row. Um, from pure basic research to use-inspired basic research and back again. And I think the emphasis at IES on educationally impactful and educationally relevant research has some use-inspired basic research, but ultimately the idea is to come up with a curriculum or a new math program or a way of teaching fractions that really has an impact in the real world, very much applied research. And I, that's, that's the way I understand what was going on on one side of the Potomac with IES and the other side of the Potomac with the NSF centers over the last 10 years. It'd be interesting to see what happens um, in the next 10 years. Okay, educational neuroscience. Where does it fit? Um, well, there's some neuroscience that fits very much up in this corner where the the, a lot of the emphasis is on very sophisticated imaging and measurement techniques of what's going on in the brain. And the implications for any kind of application are, are way down the road. They're not really all that clear. There's also some work in which we're really trying to just get the right way to teach fractions into kids' heads and make sure that they've represented number in a certain way. I try to understand how to estimate quantity, things like that. I think this center clearly fills right in this, in this quadrant here. Some of you may have seen these uh, pictures before. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's uh, the whole educational neuroscience thing in Pasteur's quadrant, uh, there's, it's like a, it's really not much of a, in my mind, it's not much of a, an issue. It clearly belongs right in this uh, Pasteur's quadrant um, because of the the emphasis on both advancing basic research and basic knowledge and having an impact, having a real impact on programs and on people and on the practice of uh, dealing with students who are um, trying to master language and master mathematics and master science and all the rest of it. Okay, well, to finish up, people sometimes ask me, what do I think should go in this lower left-hand corner. What, I wonder what, what Stokes would have thought. Um, and I've thought about this for a long time, trying to figure out what kind of activity would neither advance our understanding of anything or be useful. And I finally figured it out, and I think it's the practice of faculty meetings. That's, <laughs> that's what goes in that quadrant. 
with that, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, it's just been great being here. <laughs> and there's my collaborators, a whole bunch of them, um, which I can't name since you don't know them anyhow. Um, and I'm done. <laughs> So, what's next here? Question next period. So the floor is open for questions. Melissa asked Clifton, do you have a question? He says, I do, but I'm going to hold off on a moment. On a moment. I can't hear you. So really my question has to do with one of your earlier studies. I don't, I kind of don't want to go back to that because your ending was so beautiful and I want to still think about that for a while, but anyway. Uh, so anyone else, feel free to go back to the end because I enjoyed that discussion. So you said early in your talk when you were going over different studies My question is, you were contrasting whether direct instruction works better or worse than discovery or the, the discovery method of instruction. And you did several studies related to that question. And then you asked about the sequence. What if you do essentially direct first and then discovery second or vice versa or do the same of either one? And a lot of interesting things came from that work, which is wonderful. So my question now is, why did you create that contrast of direct versus discovery? In one of your slides, you said that there is the direct Socratic method and discovery. Why did you not ask what are any advantages or the efficiency of the Socratic method, something that is essentially a combination of the two. So not doing nothing and then giving instruction or vice versa. Why not look at the Socratic method? I was just wondering what um, we know about the Socratic methods as, they re as it relates to direct or okay. discovery <clears throat> learning. Um, let's see. Your, your question, uh, first of all, I think you're, you noticed that in one of the first studies, we had three kinds of instruction. Socratic was the middle one, and then we left it out in the later studies. And that's sort of just a technical point. We left it out just so that the later studies could have more of a clear contrast between direct and pure discovery. The, the broader question is, um, shouldn't there be, should there be some kind of mix um, where there's a little bit of each kind of instruction depending on the context. Um, and I, I think in order to uh, show you the main effects in the studies that I've been running, we have everybody in one pure condition and everybody in another pure condition. But if you watch the tutor when it's running, the cognitive tutor, it's really all over the place. Sometimes it's being quite direct other times it's backing off, it's more open-ended, which is what a good teacher would do all the time. So I think the, the answer is that if you want to um, show the main effects of a certain kind of instruction, we've actually heightened the contrast between them and shown that one of them, which is claimed to be extremely effective, is really not so effective. But I think in any realistic teaching context, we're going to have to have a mix of these. And it's probably going to be domain dependent. Um, the particular thing that we're teaching, which is how to design an unconfounded experiment, is very hard to discover because you don't get any feedback that you have a confound. And so this seems like a domain in which direct instruction should be very effective. If there's other contexts in which there's pretty good feedback that you've made some kind of mistake, then those would be just domains in which discovery would be probably pretty effective. 
And what I'd like to see is a, a much broader range of different approaches and different contexts. So I'd like to say, okay, we're teaching something that has almost no feedback. Children are trying to identify a cause. If they don't know how to do that, they can't figure it out. Let's teach those kids and that topic direct instruction. If there's some other topic we're teaching, like how does photosynthesis work, maybe there's an entirely different approach to it. Um, that, that's sort of the, the best answer I could give in the short run. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, I do have another thought, but I'll hold off on that question until later. Hi, so my question has to do with what you're studying when you compare discovery learning versus direct instruction. Do you see any potential for the experience of the children themselves to have an effect? Like if they've already learned a similar concept, how, would that, how might that affect the results of your study? Um, well, if the students already had a pretty good idea of what an unconfounded experiment is, they would probably find our training a little boring. And in fact, on the tutor, on the computer tutor, we do an initial assessment. And if the children are already doing pretty well, we don't go down into any of that detail. We give them one or two more trials. Um, sometimes we have more factors in the experiment. And then we just say, well, they've already mastered it. We certainly don't want to be teaching kids who already understand something completely well. So that, that, uh, just as in a classroom, you know, a teacher's going around and she realizes that two of the kids in the class already understand today's topic. She might not have them fill out the workbooks all afternoon. She's not gonna do that. And so once we have an adaptive tutor, we can diagnose where the kids are and just skip, or give them a much more complicated setting. We might have more factors, more levels. Um, we might have some counterintuitive uh, results. So if the kids expect a certain factor to have a cause in a certain direction um, and we can detect that, then we might give them an experiment that, that counter, counter, uh, contradicts that. Thank you. I found your presentation thrilling. I found it um, beautiful and elegant, and the science about the science beautiful. And I, just as a comment, I was very, I found very satisfying the question, evaluating the effectiveness of direct versus discovery, um, uh, uh, teaching and learning, because um, just from uh, experiences working uh, in, in this area, um, it's more, I, I found um, certain areas to be philosophically and uh, in, a, in a dogma about one versus the other. And I never had the mechanism to present to them why uh, extreme discovery approaches were not that effective and why the human being does need instruction at some point. And so for me, this is very refreshing to be able to identify concrete, solid, sophisticated work to ask and answer the question. Just as a concrete thing, I was the chair of the Department of Education at Dartmouth for five years. And the state, as a state level, had a philosophical commitment to discovery and teaching science. And I grappled with how to approach 
uh, philosophical position mm -hmm. uh, when in our cognitive neuroscience labs we were seeing the impact of, for example, not exposing a child to phonological segmentation or, you know, various, uh, they have to discover language and discover aspects of its systematicity without any kind of experiential interaction mm -hmm. at a more instructional level. So, for me, this was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Also, your quadrant was fascinating, and I know that um, Clifton and others in the room were fascinated in the situation of asking basic questions and use and um, you're def you guys are definitely doing that we're very excited thank you this is great does anyone else want to comment about the quadrant it's i think one, one thing one thing about the pastor's quadrant mindset is it's okay to be in edison's quadrant particularly when you're in an applied area when you're really trying to affect and you, you really put on a different hat. You put on your, you know, I was, I was trained as an engineer. And so I'm very comfortable with doing engineering. What's that mean? It means there's a lot of things you're going to build into a, uh, an instructional program that really are not based on your research at all. The core design might be based on your research and what you know about acquisition of language and about signing and all the rest of it. But you're going to have to make a decision about what color to use on your interface or how big should the icons be. And you might get some advice from people in human-computer interaction, but eventually you're going to design that thing with a lot of stuff in it that might be important that you really don't have scientific support for. And that's just the nature of engineering. You know, you put together a complex vehicle, like a car, and you don't know if it's the optimal car in the world. It probably isn't. That's why there's so many different kind of cars in the world. I might just um, uh, confirm uh, Laura Ann's excitement. Um, uh, as a clinician, as I was talking about earlier this morning, um, we're constantly thinking about how do we use it, how do we use it, how do we use it, but also what does it mean? Why mm -hmm. are we using this approach with this child? Um, my mother is a special educator, and she worked for many years in a elementary school with a administrator who was very convinced in, in discovery-based learning. And again and again and again, they really butted heads because how do you teach, first of all, an autistic child who won't look at the teacher um, uh, how to do algebra um, uh, you, and then we know from evidence in um, uh, my field, communication sciences and disorders, that children who are disordered definitely benefit from direct instruction because they didn't discover it naturally in the first place. Mm -hmm. They have a deficit in that mm -hmm. area. And so I can't wait to talk about this with my peers. Um, I think that it uh, is going to be a really great thing to share in um, uh, helping us sort of walk the line between scientist and therapist. Okay. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs>